The Jewish Community Council of Victoria welcomes you to the 2022 Yom HaShoah Virtual Holocaust Commemoration. Please be upstanding for the Australian National Anthem. Australians are Please welcome the President of the Jewish Community Council of Victoria, Daniel Agian SC. Good evening, and welcome to our community's annual JCCV Yom HaShoah commemoration. A time to mourn, to grieve, to remember, and to reflect, together. Before we formally begin this event, we invite you to create a space at home that allows you to participate as fully as possible. You might like to light a yardside candle, turn off your phone, and sit comfortably in an appropriate place. We begin with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands from which we are joining. I am on Bunwarung land, so I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge their continued custodianship of country. I invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where you are joining. The recent Gandal survey found that awareness of the Holocaust and support for its commemoration is high amongst the general Australian community. However, Australia's own connections to the Holocaust are largely unknown. The survey found that targeted education about the Holocaust is the key to improving awareness. Such awareness is associated with warmer feelings towards Jews, religious minorities, asylum seekers, and First Nations people. Better Holocaust knowledge can lead to a more caring and cohesive society. Remembering together is thus critical. I remember my late grandfather, Arthur Lehner, who was born in Satmar, Romania, and who at age 23 was liberated from the Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria, weighing slightly more than 30 kilograms. I remember my late grandmother, Eva Lena, nee Reich, who escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto and hid in the Polish countryside for the duration of the war, under a false name and in perpetual fear of being discovered. I remember, as a teenager myself, finding copies of my mother's applications to the International Red Cross Tracing Service for information about long lost relatives. There were forms, so many forms, 20 or 30 perhaps, each representing a name, an individual lost to my family where my grandparents had survived by sheer chance. Many of you have similar stories, a lived generational experience of survivorship that washed up on the shores of this country, devastated and damaged, but determined to rebuild. It is that common experience which tonight we remember together. By doing so, we remind ourselves and others of the lessons of the Holocaust. By remembering together, we increase our collective awareness 
and make our society more caring and cohesive. A message from His Excellency, Mr. Amir Maimon, Ambassador of the State of Israel to Australia. Shalom and good evening. Thank you very much to the Jewish Community Council of Victoria for hosting this very special Yom HaShoah event, Remembering Together. The act of remembering and honoring the victims of the Shoah has never been more important. We have witnessing a dramatic increase in Holocaust denial and distortion. Anti-Semitism is rising globally and recent research from Deakin University shows that nearly one quarter of Australian adults have little to no knowledge of the Holocaust. We are all responsible for keeping the memory of this dark chapter alive. We must never forget so we can ensure never again. Despite the painful price paid by the brutal murder of six million Jewish men, women and children in Europe, the Jewish nation ended the war victorious. Today, the Jewish population exceeds the numbers presented in the Wanzer Conference. The attempt to annihilate European Jewry failed and out of the ashes rose Israel. As the only Jewish state, Israel exceeds the expectations of a small nation. We have more Nobel Prizes per capita than the United States, France and Germany. As the startup nation, Israeli innovation has changed the world in the areas of cybersecurity, health, defense, agriculture, and more. Israel will never forget where we came from. We will never forget the six millions who were murdered. Our success is for them and for the future Israelis who, despite ongoing threats, continue changing the world for a better future. Thank you. Todaraba. My name is Lena Fishman, and it is my privilege to co-host this evening with Rabbi Helbrin. Many of us, the survivors in our midst, and myself as a descendant, live with the Shoah daily. It informs our thoughts and dreams, and has shaped our lives dramatically. Our Jewish community and Australian society more broadly bears its imprint. But tonight is different. Tonight, we set aside an hour or two to consciously and in a focused way engage in Zachor, remembrance, of the millions we lost and pay tribute to our survivors. While it is difficult to believe that we are marking our third year of commemoration online and thus only virtually remembering together, rather than physically, we have worked hard to make this a shared experience if we all enter into it. As in previous years, this evening will consist of a mix of survivor testimony, messages, reflections from the younger generations, music, images, prayer and ceremonial lighting of candles. To attempt to remember the Shoah in its entirety is impossible, given its magnitude. Dates can lend a focus to our remembrance. Ninety years ago, in April 1932, Germany's democracy was unstable and the Nazis were on the rise. But the prospect of them gaining absolute power would have seemed far-fetched. Ten years later, by April 1942, not only did they have total control of Germany, they had conquered much of Europe and had decided on the final solution to the Jewish question, concentration and extermination, a policy that soon led to the deaths of six million Jews. But three years later, by 1945, the Nazis were defeated, and here we are in 2022, testifying through our losses, but also through our presence, to how dramatically the world can descend into barbarity 
and also its capacity to rebuild. We are very fortunate this evening to have Charles German, a survivor of the Shoah, share his testimony with us. Rather than one single account, his recollections are divided into different periods of time. He will start with his memories of life in Romania before the war. My name is Kurt Charles German. I was called Kurt Chaim Schmatnik at birth and I am a child survivor of the Holocaust. I was born in Czernowitz in 1936 to a middle class family. As a child, I had a great time. My father had horses and carriages and sleighs. He would take me on rides with him. It was such fun. Because my father kept horses, carriages and sleighs, he needed space. We lived on the edge of the city near a creek and on one of my exploration trips I nearly fell into a well which supplied water to us. On sunny days my mother would take me to play in the park. Chandavitz was the capital of the Romanian province of Bukovina and is a city in the western Ukraine and is it's historically a cosmopolitan community. Chanovitz was once dubbed Little, Little Vienna and Jerusalem upon the Prut. During the 19th and early 20th century, Chanovitz became a center of both Romanian and Ukrainian national movements. In 1908, it was the site of the first Yiddish language conference. Chanovitz once had a Jewish community of over 50,000, less than a third of whom survived World War II. Romanian lawyer and reserve officer Theodore Krivener, as well as a then city mayor, Trojan Popovici, supported by General Vasily Ionesco, saved almost 20,000 Jewish people. Initially, the governor of Bukovina, Cornelio Kolotesko, allowed only 190 Jews to remain. However, Trajan Popovici, after an incredible effort, obtained from the then dictator of Romania, Marshal Leon Antonesco, an allowance of 20,000 people. After World War II, the city was key role in the Brecha network, which helped Jews to emigrate to the then mandated Palestine. From the difficult conditions after the war, following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the majority of the remaining Jewish population emigrated to Israel and the United States. A famous member of the latter emigration was actress Bela Kunis. Chernovitz was inhabited by Ukrainians, Romanians, Poles, Ruthenians, and Jews, Roma, Gypsies, and German. During its affiliation with the Austro Hungarian monarchy, Chernovitz enjoyed prosperity and culture as the capital of the Bukovina crown land. After World War II, the Shoah, and the resettlement and expulsion of whole ethnic groups, including Germans, Romanians, this status was diminished. Today, the Ukrainians are the dominant population group. Chernovitz's change in demographic diversity is demonstrated by the following population statistics. Once Romanian and Ukrainians formed the majority of the population. However, after 1870, Yiddish or German-speaking Jews surpassed the Romanians 
as the largest population group of the town. After 1880, the Ukrainians surpassed the Romanians as the second largest population group. What distinguished the Jews of Chernovitz from the rest of European Jewry was that they were farmers and land barons. In addition to the usual profession, the Jews were educated, middle-class people. In 1940, northern Bukovina and Bessarabia were occupied by the Soviets. In 1941, the Soviets withdrew. The German and Romanian Nazi forces took control. Uncle Morris was taken by the Russians to Siberia just because he was a capitalist and had a shoe shop. Uncle Munu was one of the 400 Jews who were shot by the Germans. He was shot just because he was a Jew and the Germans could kill him at their whim. I was five years old. One way that the Holocaust has shaped my life is it's given me an appreciation for everything. For the little things, like having a comfortable bed to sleep in and knowing that there'll be food on the table. And for the big things, like being able to go to a Jewish school and get an education and feeling safe as a Jew in Melbourne. It's also given me an appreciation for my heritage. I know that so many were persecuted just for who they were, just for the, the religion they were born. So I appreciate being able to practice Judaism and being able to live freely as a Jew today. The Holocaust affects me as I personally was not affected directly as I didn't have any grandparents or family members that I knew in the Holocaust, but I'm affected indirectly through hearing stories of my friends and other Jewish communities around and going to a Jewish school my whole life where every year we learn about and discuss stories and recollections of the past and look at memorabilia so that we don't forget the stories and I can pass them on. My grandfather being a Holocaust survivor has taught me to embrace life and embrace the miracle he has given me, which is everyday life. In doing so, I thank him for uh, contributing to Judaism, being able to, being able to be kept alive. And while, every, while it's still alive, individuals who are Jewish may not really, might only adhere to it, not really be actually able to find a connection to it. So I think my purpose that he has given me in apart from life, just living is to be able to help individuals find a purpose to it. And through his survival, it has enabled me to, you know, really reach for my dreams. I have gone for school captaincy at my school and I'm currently the Jewish life captain. And it's been, and it's really because of him that I wanna work harder for all of these all the kids at my school and not just in our school but in our Jewish community to feel engaged and proud to be Jewish and know our history and find a connection to it that they can they can really love and enjoy just like I do with my Judaism so in conclusion it's really it's what it's meant to me is really enjoying my religion and enjoying what it provides for me and the family that it has given me and and in my life, I aim for others to feel like that as well. As a result of the atrocities and utter discrimination faced by the Jewish people in the Shoah, it has influenced me to continue the Jewish traditions and uphold the values. Since many Jews perished during the Shoah, it reminds me to be grateful for all that I have and continue their legacies especially knowing my great-grandfather who was a survivor. It has taught me to stand up to anti-Semitism and bigotry and never to be a bystander. The Shoah shapes the way I value others and injustice around the world. And I hope to continue this and uphold all the traditions and Jewish values. The Shoah has definitely influenced the way I view injustice around the world and my emotional response to it. Um, as a great granddaughter and granddaughter of survivors of the Shoah, I think I've really 
learnt the importance of education um, and how it's such a privilege that I get to go to this school and also have an amazing education that can't be taken away from me. Um, I also think that the Shoah has shaped my Zionism and my connection to Israel because I realise how important it is for the Jewish people to have a homeland that they can run to in times of crisis and need, especially since anti-Semitism is not um, gone from our world, unfortunately. Um, I think that the Shoah has also shaped uh, the way that I interact with people, my empathy, um, and how I believe that we need equality for everyone, especially for minorities and vulnerable groups around the world, and that as Jewish people, we have the added responsibility of um, helping and tikkun olam and healing the world even more because we've firsthand experienced that, um, forms of discrimination and persecution. So, As mentioned, this year marks the 80th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference, a meeting where Nazi officers and bureaucrats gathered to coolly develop the murderous plan known as the Final Solution at a villa by a lake in a Berlin suburb in the most comfortable and civilized of places, the fate of European Jewry was sealed. From here, death camps were established, killing methods devised, and deportation plans executed, thus propelling the world into its darkest chapter in history. Many thousands of Jews from Chernovitz and surrounding areas were loaded into cattle cars and deported to Mogilev Podolsky. I, I was one of them. Mogilev Podolsky is in the Transnistria region of the Ukraine. Mogilev Podolsky was occupied by German and Romanian troops in July 1941. Soon thereafter, thousands of Jews in the towns were murdered by the occupiers. Mogadev Podolsky soon became a transit camp for Jews expelled from Bessarabia and Bukovina to Transistria. From September 1941 to February 1942, more than 55 thousand deportees came through the town. Thousands of people ja were jammed into the camp and treated cruelly by the Romanian guards. Many Jews were not allowed to stay in Mogilev Podolsky. Thousands were forced to travel by foot to nearby villages and towns. The 15,000 who initially were permitted to stay in town organized themselves into groups. Some two to three thousand were given residency permits, while the rest lived in constant fear of being deported to the Transnistrian interior of forced labor. I remember it was still light. The rain was coming down in sheets and we were being loaded into cattle cars and transported to the banks of the Nesta River in the town of Ataki. A wooden barge came close to the shoreline and we were ordered to get on quickly. Schnell, schnell is still echoing in the black void of night when sleep eludes me and before the nightmares begin again. Many were not quick enough. Soldiers swore hitting out with rifles or whips. Children fell into the cold, raging waters to drown. The barge was filled to capacity. Standing room only. Fear and exhaustion became our only companions. I was separated from my mother, and my mother screamed, Mein Kind, my Kind, let me go with my Kind on the same barge. Some held hands. Some held bundles of clothing and valuables, mothers clutching their children in vice-like grips. No one spoke. There was nothing to speak about. Eyes were fixed either on the floor 
of the barges or on the loud waves around us. The soldiers on the shore can still be heard, the shooting finally dulled by the sound of the waves. The barge landed on the other side and the mayhem began again. Herded together in groups, surrounded by armed soldiers, we began our march. It's cold and still raining. Each step is a chore, our shoes sinking inches into the mud where we lose them. Our shoes or boots were nevertheless are forced to trudge on. In Bogolev Podolsky, we were placed in synagogues, schools and other public places. These buildings had no doors or windows and were unfit to serve as dwellings. Hundreds of us huddled together on freezing floors. All the children were put in, put in lines and instructed to begin working. We were placed in front of dead bodies and they told us our job was to go to the corpses and remove the gold teeth, clean them, throw away the white ones. I refused and started crying and vomited and then they broke my finger with a club. I remember the smells of blood and children crying. If you don't work, you got a punishment. It was a new reality. Every day at the same time, a cart pulled by a tired horse passed by to gather the dead who had been brought outside. They were tossed onto the cart like firewood, one on top of the other. Piles of nameless corpses were buried in a common grave, unmarked to this day. This routine became normal. I was six years old. We are called on to remember the Shoah, but for most of us, we are attempting to remember an event that is so far removed from our reality that it is almost an impossibility. Primo Levi, an industrial chemist from Italy, was deported to Auschwitz in 1943, where he managed to survive due to his usefulness. In addition to his wildly read memoir, Survival in Auschwitz, and other writings, he wrote the poem Shema, a year after his liberation. It recounts the extreme and inhumane conditions of victims eking out a pitiful existence, inverting the words of the Jewish prayer to command remembrance. You who live secure in your warm houses, who return at evening to find hot food and friendly faces, consider whether this is a man who labours in the mud, who knows no peace, who fights for a crust of bread, who dies at a yes or a no. Consider whether this is a woman, without hair or name, with no more strength to remember. Eyes empty and womb cold as a frog in winter. Consider that this has been, I commend these words to you. Engrave them on your hearts. When you are in your house, when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise. Repeat them to your children, or may your houses crumble. Disease render you powerless, your offspring avert their faces from you. Stille, stille, lomio schweigen, quor im wachsen doch. Sobben seifer pflanzt die Sonne im grünen See zum Blau. Sphären wagen zu Ponau zu, es wird kein Weg zurück. Hier ist Tatate wo verschwunden und mit ihm das Glück. Still, Herr Kind, meins wenn ich deutze, es hilft nicht kein Gewein. Und 
Clothes and valuables so tightly clung to during our dreaded crossing now became serious source of currency used to buy the necessities of life, food. In Margaret of Podolsky, like other camps of Transistia, we bartered for food. Certain articles were more valuable than others to the Ukrainian peasants. Clothing, leather goods and jewellery became the most sought-after items. It is now December. The temperature of below 40 degrees was new normal. During this time, an epidemic of typhus broke out. My mother became sick, so weak to walk she had to support her weight on crutches. She did improve, but only with the assistance of apples I used to get from one of the other children who stole them from the orchards adjoining the camp. Those of us who managed to live through the first winter began to have some hope of surviving. However, each season brought its own problems. In the spring, soldiers rounded us up for labour projects. Those who managed to survive the first winter began to have some hope of surviving. But in spring, soldiers began rounding up groups of people, and my parents and I were sent to Skazenets, now called Skazenetsi, in the Ukraine, a camp with a large group assigned to build roads. Each morning, the adults were taken to work and brought back at night. While the children remained in the camp, surrounded by barbed wire with guards stationed only metres apart, somehow I managed to get to my parents at lunchtime and they would share their meagre rations with me. One day a German officer stopped them from feeding me 
and took me to his guard tower. He told me to come at midday every day and he would give me food. The officer continued to feed me for some time, but one day when I went to the tower, the officer was not there. Some thought he was caught giving me food and was shot for his act of humanity and kindness. In December 1943, over 3,000 Jews were allowed to return to Romania and in March 1944, Jewish leader in Bucharest got permission to bring back 1,400 orphans. Mogilev Podolsky was liberated that month. Many Jewish men were immediately drafted by the Soviet army. One of them drafted was my late father. Many who stayed in the city were killed by the German bombs. Most of the Portis were allowed to return to Romania in the spring of 1945. In March 1944, the Soviets began their offensive in the Ukraine. Long columns of retreating German soldiers seemed resigned to the success of the Soviet assault. We waited excitedly for the Red Army to liberate us. The German soldiers thought this advance as their end. In the spring of 1944, when the Red Army liberated us from the years of human degradation in the camps of Transistia, we were still not entirely free. Following our liberation, many male survivors of the camps were recruited into the Red Army to fight the Germans. I'm now nine years old. We know that survival was a mix of luck, resources and resourcefulness. Fateful decisions, often made in haste, and random acts of goodness and kindness. Lights amid the darkness, rare but still there. These acts included a guard turning a momentary blind eye and righteous Gentiles offering temporary or permanent hiding. Courage and bravery were demonstrated in acts of resistance and sabotage by fighters, working through Jewish and underground channels. And of course, in the determination of the Allied forces to defeat Germany at incredible cost to human life. Every survivor here this evening and their descendants has an incredible story about survival. Each unique, but each with some combination of the above factors. Unter deiner weiser Stern, under your white stars, is a beautiful and haunting Yiddish song based on the Yiddish poetry of Avraham Sutzkewe while in the Vilna ghetto, describing the recurring alienation and loneliness, making more powerful the special pleading for a divine intervention, for a sign of reassurance. Under your white stars, stretch to me your white hand. My words are tears that want to rest in your hand. As for the history of this poem, Avram Sutskeva is believed to have written this poem in the Vilna ghetto, where it was originally set to a haunting melody by Avraham Brudno and sung there by Zlata Kaczaginski in a theatrical production of the play Diogen in Fass, The Hunt in the Barrel, a parody of Diogenes in a Barrel. After the liquidation of the ghetto, Sutskever joined the partisan fighters and survived the Holocaust. Brudno was deported to a German concentration camp in Estonia, where he was murdered in 1943 or 1944. One of the most beautiful songs to have come out of the Vilna ghetto 
unter deine weise Stern, under your white stars, directly addresses God. The poem speaker expresses the agony of his situation and calls out for help and acknowledgement. Unter deine weiße Stern streckt zu mir dein weiße Hand. Meine Wörter sind entwahren, willen ruhen in dein Hand. Sah es dunkel, sah auf Inkel in mein Keller dicken Und ich hab gar nicht kein Winkel, sei zu schenken dir zurück. Und ich hab gar nicht kein Winkel, sei zu schenken dir zurück. My devoted God, I offer every single thing I own. For the fire that I suffer leaves me burning all alone. Only in the holes and cellars with murderous rest my days I share. I run higher over roof and spire and I search. Where are you? Where? Nehmen Jürgen mich mit Schuhe, Trepp und Häufen mit Gewoi. Hänge ich ein geplatztes Tune, und ich sing zu dir so. Unter deine weiße Stern streckt zu mir dein weiße Haar. Meine Wörter sind in Tränen, Willen ruhen in dein Hand. Meine Wörter sind in Tränen, Willen ruhen in dein Hand. As the redevelopment of the Jewish Holocaust Centre comes to life as the Melbourne Holocaust Museum, we passionately believe that it is important that we continue doing what our museum represents. We are a bastion of memory. We seek to preserve and transmit a history of destruction unprecedented in its scale. Melbourne Holocaust survivors founded the Melbourne Holocaust Museum 38 years ago with a mission to educate and commemorate. We are committed to their legacy, which is one of hope, of resistance and of endurance. We are, as Kirsten Thompson, architect of the Melbourne Holocaust Museum redevelopment has said, and I quote, a Holocaust center in Melbourne, designed as a repository of communal memory and a space from which the survivors may speak. Oral testimony of survivors contributes to our understanding of the Holocaust. It also sheds light on the forms and functions of memory as victims relive devastating experiences of pain, humiliation and loss. While observing and acknowledging Yom HaShoah, we also pause to think of those who are currently under attack and those being persecuted for their identity. As caretaker of over 1,500 testimonies of the Holocaust, we feel particular urgency 
to magnify the voices in our testimonies collection, to combat the virulent hate that spurs violence in the world today. I once asked Kitsche Altman, Zichron Nebracha, beloved Holocaust survivor and Holocaust Centre guide, what does the museum mean to you? She replied, for me, the Holocaust Museum always was and remains a natural custodian of survivors' memories and pain forever. Tonight, we remember together. Shalom from the Mount of Remembrance in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, to the Jewish community of Victoria in this uh, Yom HaShoah. These are very challenging days for the entire world. The names, cities that we knew from uh, dark chapters in our uh, Jewish history are now again in the news in very sad circumstances. Uh, Kiev, uh, Kharkov, uh, Lvov are places now of uh, terrible uh, scenes of uh, devastation and death. Um, we here in Yad Vashem are deeply involved in trying to rescue and giving shelter here in Israel to descendants of uh, righteous among the nations, Hasidei uh, Omot Olam, that rescued Jews uh, uh, and uh, endangered their own lives in order to do that. Even one righteous among the nations herself, 96 years old, is in her way to Israel with her, with her uh, help. Um, as I said, very challenging days. Many of the lessons that we learned from the Shoah, from the Holocaust, unfortunately become very relevant, very actual these days. Let's hope together that uh, we uh, will see in the coming weeks and months and years a better world, a world in which uh, the lessons of the Holocaust, the lessons of uh, uh, being a, a humanitarian, and in compassionate to each other will be learned and implemented. Thank you so much. I remember because it's our responsibility as young people and as the Australasian Union of Jewish Students to remember the traumas of the Shoah. For us, it's a personal reminder of how anti-Semitism can play out and the trauma and damages that it can create on society. It's our responsibility to ensure that other young people are educated and to ensure that other community groups also remember the, the Shoah and to ensure that they understand the personal connection that we have and to ensure that it never again means never again. I remember because my Bubba was a Holocaust survivor, my Zeta's family left Europe in the early 1930s they came to Melbourne and they started the Jewish Labour Bund, part of a Jewish youth movement, particularly a progressive Jewish youth movement. I feel so honoured to be living out my grandparents and my great grandparents' legacy of educating and empowering youth. I remember the Holocaust through my education, where I understand and recognise how privileged I am to be able to study higher education and to achieve the goals that I want to when so many people and other generations were unfortunate and were unable to do so. I remember because I want to honour my family and the others who perished, who resisted and who continue to tell their stories. I remember to commemorate the ordinary people who fought bravely to look out for the Jewish community and others who were persecuted and ostracised during the Shoah. I remember because this cruelty cannot happen again and we must learn from the bravery of those who came before us. Kazakh Vermats. I remember so that those who perished in the Holocaust are never forgotten, so that our memories ensure that they live on through us. Both Jew and non-Jew are never forgotten it is especially important nowadays. Um, as time goes on, there are less survivors that are still with us. And therefore it is important that we take on those memories and teach them to the future generations. I remember because it is my duty as a Jew 
and as the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor to preserve the stories of our ancestors and of our families. This means standing up to anti-Semitism, both big and small, at uni, at school, in the workforce, to, to ensure that such atrocities are never repeated. As a member of the Jewish youth, the responsibility falls on us to decide how these stories will be remembered. I remember so that I never have to see history repeat itself. In an era of disinformation, hatred and division, it is more important now than ever that we remember the lessons of the past. Remembering the Holocaust reminds us of the human sacrifice that the world had to pay because people were too ignorant to love those around them. We remember so that we can really say never again. I remember because my grandparents wanted me to remember. My brother and Zayda were both Holocaust survivors, with Zayda being a, a partisan that fought in the forests. They both, ever since I was little, kept on wanting me to understand the importance of Holocaust education to the fact that my sister's becoming an expert in it. And it's something that I regularly talk about, you know, with all the youth movements and through my position as the AZYC chairperson of Victoria. Um, it's always something that I've been really interested in that when we go on March of the Living and it is something that I'll ever hold close to my heart and will continue to educate on um, until I can. We now turn to the central and most moving part of the evening when we remember together through the lighting of candles a significant number of survivors came to Australia, the majority coming to Melbourne where Despite their deep loss and grief, they built new lives with determination. Though their numbers are dwindling with the passing of the years, we are privileged to invite six grouping of survivors, together with their families in some cases, to light a candle in memory of their family members and communities. Rachamim 
Mit Kadal, mit Kadash, mei Rabba, be allem Adivrach, Jerutei, wie Amlich Malchutei, be Chayei Chon, wie Omei Chon, wie Chayei de Chol Beit Yisrael, be Agala, wie Zman Kariv, wie Merua Mein, Jehei, Shemei Rabba, Mevorach, Neolam, Olomei Olmaya, Yit Barach, wie Ishtabach, wie Paar, wie Romam, wie Nasei, Vit hadar, vit ale, vit alal, shmei de kutsha berichu. Le eila min kol birchata veshirata, tush bechata venechimata, damiram belma vimeru amen. Yehei shalama rabba min shemaya, vechayim aleinu val kol Israel, veimeru amen. Ose shalom bimromav. Hu ya ase shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael ve'imeru omein. L'chol ish yeshem. Each of us has a name, written by Zelda, Hebrew poet. Each of us has a name, given by God and given by our parents. Each of us has a name, given by our stature and our smile and given by what we wear. Each of us has a name, given by the mountains and given by our walls. Each of us has a name, given by the stars and given by our neighbors. Each of us has a name, given by our sins and given by our longing. Each of us has a name, given by our enemies, and given by our love. Each of us has a name, given by our celebrations, and given by our work. Each of us has a name, given by the seasons, and given by our blindness. Each of us has a name, given by the sea, and given by our death. L'cholish yeshem, שנתן לו אלוהים, ונתנו לו אביו ואמו, לכל איש יש שם, שנתנו לו קומתו ואופן חיוכו, ונתן לו הריג, לכל איש יש שם, שנתנו לו הערים, ונתנו לו כתליו, לכל איש יש שם, שנתנו לו המזלות, ונתנו לו שכניו, לכל איש יש שם, שנתנו לו חטאיו, ונתנה לו כמיהתו. לכל איש יש שם שנתנו לו שונאיו, ונתנה לו אהבתו. לכל איש יש שם שנתנו לו חגיו, ונתן לו מלאכתו. לכל איש יש שם שנתנו לו תקופות השנה, ונתן לו עברונו. לכל איש יש שם שנתן לו אלוהים, ונתן לו אביו ואמו. לכל איש יש שם שנתן לו הים, ונתן לו מותו. My mother and I were left to find our own way back to Chernovitz by whatever means were available. We walked with occasional rides in horse-drawn wagons, mostly with sympathetic peasants. I clearly remember being given decorated hard-boiled eggs, such a luxury after the potato peelings and soups rationed to us for four years. It is difficult to reconcile the difference between a four years in concentration camp and the impact of the trauma on the rest of my life. Those of us who survived reached the threshold of a new life. In 1946, with the assistance of the Brecha, we were smuggled into Italy by Yugoslavia and spent three years in various TP camps. I first went to school in Milan where I learned Italian and began learning Hebrew at the Camp Hebrew School. Our teachers were Shlichim from Palestine and were former soldiers of the Jewish Brigade 
of the British Army. Part of the 5,000 Jewish volunteers. They treated us child survivors as precious objects, as they knew how few of us had survived. They instilled in me a love for Israel, which has been my guide all my life. While in the DP camp in Trani, a former Italian army base, we celebrated the Jewish holidays. There were sporting activities, and we were taught how to plant trees and vegetables. We played with toy guns, which replicated the originals, which we were to use on arrival in Israel. I had my first ever ice cream in Italy, and I can still taste it. And I compare all the ice creams I have eaten to that one in Italy. That one tastes, none tastes as good. We were sponsored to come to Australia by family in Kensington and arrived at the Greek ship Cyrenia in 1949. I remember my first day at school. I did not know one word of English. I was enrolled at Kensington State School. In school, the teacher pointed to me and said, you are special. Wow, special is good. I did not know that. Not the so bright kids sat at the back of the class. A teacher, a former army officer, communicated with me in German and took pity on me and spent many weeks teaching me English. I managed to get into Footscray Technical College. I did well. I was appointed a prefect. After graduation, I worked as a knitting machine mechanic for a couple of years in a knitting factory. I did not like the indoors. I asked my employer if I could become a salesman for him and go to the retail shop to sell his merchandise. That was my first effort in sales. His product was good and reasonable in price. I did not earn enough, so I got a weekend job selling real estate. I liked that much better and have been in real estate ever since. I'm ha happily married. I have three children and five grandchildren. I was a member of Habonim, a Zionist movement, and I still have friends that are made in the movement. I, together with the late Ralph Levy, am proud to say that we did lots of planning for the construction of the Safari Synagogue in Hotham Street, in St Kilda. Shadows of the Holocaust are always lurking in our background. It never ceases to amaze me that each time I meet survivors, their story is unique and is regretful that so many survivors have now died, their stories never told. I have been involved in the Jewish community and Zionist movement for many years. In my youth as a Madrid in Habonim, in recent years as president of the Katzetla Verband, and now with my involvement as a guide at the Holocaust Museum in Elsterwick. My aim is to tell my story to our young people so that our experience in the Holocaust is recorded and never forgotten. During a recent Shabbaton, I found myself seated opposite a man of my age, whose name was Yaakov Chaimov, and I was amazed to learn that he was from Mogila. All conversation around us suddenly stopped as Yaakov proceeded to tell me that he survived by stealing apple from the surrounding orchards. Yaakov was a brave boy who shared his precious apple with me, helping my mother to recover from typhus. There is one other child survivor in Melbourne from Mogadav Podolsk. His name is Max Druckmann, 
and our bond is like that of brothers. A few weeks ago, I had a call from a woman introducing herself as Nelly Brecha. She was the daughter of my uncle Bunyu. Hang on a minute, I said. Uncle Bunyu was shot by the Germans. She said, yes, he was. Somehow, my family politics, I was never told that Uncle Munyu had been married. Nilly was never told by her mother who her biological father was. My, no my mother never told me Munyu had been married. I wonder why. Again, we're living in turbulent time. The invasion of Ukraine, innocent people have to leave their home, their future unknown. I will leave you with a message. Be tolerant. Do not judge by religion or ethnicity. May there be peace in the world. Thank you. I'm Charles German. I'm now 83 years old. The show reminds me that despite the pain, the horrors and the suffering our people went through, there was still hope. Um, it shows the importance of our self-determination and the fight that we went through. It inspired me to lead um, and empower the next generation of Jews to fulfill whatever dream they set their mind to. The Shoah plays a big part in my life as my grandmother is a, ho a Holocaust survivor. Growing up, hearing her stories and seeing her pull out different memorabilia, like a piece of her mother's dress that she used to escape the ghetto, plays a big part in my life as it teaches me and my siblings to remember things like about the Holocaust and also to remember never again. The reason the Shoah uh, impacts my life today uh, is because I can really see uh, the family values imbued, imbued within my parents from my grandparents who had to flee from um, Hungary and Poland and losing their families and having to run away really has, has made my, my family very strong about family relationships and being strong together. Um, another way the Holocaust has impacted my life today is it's made me realise how proud, how important it is to be proud to be Jewish and how people were murdered because of that pride and we're lucky to live in, in a time where we can celebrate that. Uh, yeah, and another reason why, why, we're so, why the Holocaust really impacts my life um, every day is because it makes me appreciate uh, how lucky we are to live in the 21st century free from persecution and attacks. And uh, it really makes me appreciate the amazing schools and community that we've got here in Melbourne. Despite the horrors of the Shoah, I myself choose to um, express my Judaism freely and try to honour those and commemorate, the, commemorate those who lost their lives through expressing my Judaism freely through my school community. And I've been granted the opportunity to be a Jewish life captain at my school, which has given me the ability to express my love for my culture and religion um, to try and honour those who have unfortunately lost their lives due to the Holocaust. The Holocaust affects almost all aspects of my life because it's affected my family and my Jewish identity stems from them. So each member of my family has had different experiences with the Holocaust, whether it be direct or indirect, and learning from them, I'm lucky enough to have four living grandparents and to have met five of my great-grandparents. Learning from them helps me to educate myself and to create a present and a future that's safe and welcoming. Had the final solution had the finality the Nazis planned for, there would be no remembrance of the Shoah and no evidence that the atrocities occurred. Himmler famously decreed it was to be an unwritten page of glory. The fact that we are remembering together in our homes, with others, in community, attests not to any form of victory. There is none to be had in the face of such loss and devastation.
but to the enduring concept of Shi'arit Haplita, the commitment of the enduring remnant to be resilient, to rebuild and renew. You, me, we are the inheritors of a mixed and painful legacy that means different things to different people. But as we shall hear in a moment or two from our Sholom Aleichem choir in Zognit Kainmol, the partisan's anthem, Mir Zainan Do, we are here, we are still here, remembering together. Thank you to Sholem Aleichem College School Choir for their moving rendition of the Partisan Song. Thank you all for joining the JCCV this evening for our Yom HaShoah commemoration, Remembering Together. I hope, as your Yahrzeit candle burns for the next 24 hours, you can take some time to remember lost family, lost places, and reflect on the legacy of the Shoah. The recent destruction of the memorial of Babi Yar serves as a reminder of the fragility of the past and the role that we can all play in being agents of remembrance. Please stand for Hatikva, the Israeli anthem and a song of hope. <laughs>
Thank you for joining us 